Thank you, Mr. Mazari and Tanaka-san. I think it's quite interesting that Mr. Mazari raised the point that tech companies today do have a responsibility when it comes to the consumers that they serve as they reach for profits and further growth that the people who help them to power their growth should not be forgotten. And with that, from a tech titan like Microsoft, it's an easy segue into the next conversation that we're going to have with a panel of distinguished guests we have here today. Uh, the panel is titled Financial Innovation, How is Digitalization Galvanizing the Financial Sector? Now to set the stage, fintech has been a booming activity here in Southeast Asia and the region because of the pandemic as people turn to their smartphones for digital finance and the underbanked in the region get opportunities to jump onto the digital bandwagon for their wealth management and savings needs. Today, we have a panel of distinguished guests who will touch on the subject from various angles, and we hope that you will be able to join us in welcoming them. Now, first, I would like to bring here to the stage and welcome Mr. Thaddeus Lee, Executive Director of the, Mr. sorry, Mr. Shi Si Kun, Group Executive and Country Head, DBS Singapore, who is here with us in person. A round of applause, please. Now, next, I would like to welcome Mr. Thaddeus Lee, Executive Director of the Asia Innovation Centre at SMBC. We welcome to the stage. A round of applause for Mr. Thaddeus Lee. It's fitting in the age of digitalization that we do have two panelists who are joining us virtually. I'd like to welcome Dr. Sutapa Amon Vivat, CEO of SCB Abacus. Dr. Amon Vivat will be joining us from Thailand. And Mr. Wei Manto, Vice Chairman of the Board of Directors and Co CEO of Momo. Mr. To will be joining us from Vietnam. The moderator of this panel is Mr. Joji Thomas Philip, founder and editor in chief of Deal Street Asia, part of the Nikkei Group and Nikkei Asia's sister publication. Joji, the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the opening panel. Uh, we had a, we started off with a fascinating session. Uh, we heard from uh, Microsoft on a lot of digital initiatives that they were part of, and this panel is more or less a continuation um, of the themes um, from the first session. So we're going to be talking about financial inclusion, how digitalization is galvanizing the financial sector. Today we are in the fourth generation of. Uh, the fourth uh, industrial revolution generation. And it's a no-brainer that, you know, this era is led by digitalization. Uh, and the COVID-19 pandemic has only accelerated the, the digitalization trend that we are witnessing all around us. And we're joined by some of the best place panelists to sort of take us through what's been happening and also look at the road ahead. Digitalization is just beyond going digital. It includes innovation, uh, speed, simplicity, contextualization, interpreting data and insights, and sort of deploying them to benefit one's uh, customers. It involves personalization. There's AI involved. Uh, there's data-driven intelligence. Uh, There's a big part of digitalization. And it covers all sectors from payments, savings, uh, investments, how we plan our future. Uh, it extends to all areas of our lives, you know, from our healthcare to shopping, and it also touches all companies, whether you're a corporate, uh, whether you're MNC, or even if you're a small and medium enterprise anywhere in Southeast Asia. If you were to look at the latest report from Google, Bain, and Tamasek, 75% of the population in Southeast Asia, which is about 450 million people, they have access to the internet. And the digital economy in Southeast Asia 
is set to become 1 trillion by 2030. We're going to be looking at some of these data points and let me uh, start by asking our four esteemed panelists just to take a minute to introduce themselves uh, and also their um, respective firms. Uh, Mr. I, I can start with uh, uh, Mr. Kuhn, uh, he is the group executive and country head DBS Singapore. Uh, can we start with you? Just take a minute to thank you for joining us and we'll just okay. take a minute to introduce uh, yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Joji. Uh, hi, my name is Z Kuhn. Uh, surname is Shi. Um, I'm the country head for DBS uh, Singapore here. Uh, Thaddeus, you want to go next? Yeah, thanks. Um, a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is uh, Thaddeus Lee. I'm from uh, SMBC. Uh, and I'm part of the Asia Innovation Center that's trying to propel uh, digitalization for the group as a whole. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sutapa, thank you for joining us uh, virtually from uh, Thailand. Uh, just take a minute to introduce yourselves and sure. also the firm um, you represent. Hi, I'm a founding CEO of SCB Abacus. Uh, our company is a data tech startup. We build inclusive digital lending products to unlock Southeast Asia's potentials, and we are committed to create a seamless experience without compromising privacy and security using our own in-house AI technology and risk models. Thank you. Uh, Wen McDo, uh, he is the Vice Chairman and the Board of Directors, Co-CEO of Momo. Uh, please go next. Hi, uh, my name is Do. I'm very glad to be here. and. Um, yeah, I come from Momo. We are the largest payment lead super app in Vietnam. We start as an e-wallet, but now we evolve to provide a full suite of financial product from investment, loan, and uh, uh, insu insurance, as well as multiple other daily life service like uh, OTA, cinema booking, and many other things on our platform. Thank you. Uh, uh, Shisi Kun, let me start with you. Uh, you know, when we want to just set the opening questions and just to set the context. Uh, when we look at Singapore, uh, it's very different from the rest of Southeast Asia. It has a robust financial infrastructure. The financial services sector here is pretty strong. So in that context, can you tell us some of the macro trends that you're sort of witnessing, which will have an impact on how companies here will operate? Well, uh, thank you. Um, I would say that uh, some of the macro trends that we have seen, particularly in the last two years, uh, with the infrastructure that you've mentioned exists in Singapore, is that there has been a very rapid adoption of everything digital, right? So digital adoption, new technology adoption has become actually a, a, a reality, particularly in the last two years. Um, and riding behind that, uh, it is not just about operations uh, through technology and digital top adoption. The exponential use of data and thereby, behind that, the whole AI capabilities, uh, data analytics, predictive analytics, those are all the new areas that have also started to be rapidly adopted by companies here in uh, both reaching out to their own clients and customers right through to actually driving their whole innovation agenda, their whole product uh, uh, development, right? We are also seeing a trend of, of uh, increasing partnerships. Because more and more, there is a blurring of lines between uh, what is being offered and how things are offered. It is much less vertical now because customers are, are kind of expecting a lot more integrated products and services. So therefore, we are also seeing a trend of companies actually starting to work together in partnerships, leveraging technology um, to integrate their solutions. So it is not just product-centric, it is actually now solutions. Uh, being, being, being driven as well. And then, of course, in my sector in particular, we are seeing uh, also the, the, the trend of uh, the unbundling of what would have been in the past traditional financial services. So you have companies who are leveraging technology to offer loans. We have got companies who are leveraging technology just to op uh, offer remittances, uh, those who are offering robo-advisory and so on and so forth. So these are some of the mega trends we are seeing here. Uh, thank you. So we'll come back to some of those trends in a bit. Uh, Therese, let me ask you, when you're from where you sit at the SMBC Asia Innovation Center, and if you were to take a helicopter view from the top, uh, what are some of the big, uh, like, what is the momentum shift that we've been witnessing in this region, especially in terms of digitalization, uh, galvanizing the financial sector? Yeah, thanks for the question. I think um, 
especially for the financial sector, I wouldn't use the word a momentum shift. I think um, it's been an experiential journey for a lot of firms. I think what has happened is that the button to accelerate uh, due to the pandemic has uh, put a lot of us at this thing called the digital first and putting the best foot forward. Um, what we're seeing is that I think a lot of us have looked at it from a very consumer-focused point of view. And I think, you know, we look at it from the daily lifestyles. But what has been a monumental or quite a wide shift, at least from my angle, is actually the pandemic has created quite fast, I guess, gaps uh, in the commercial and corporate space. Uh, two areas, right? Um, I think the first one we see is governments now working together to create what I call common data uh, facilities. Um, and we're looking at things like data identity, data trust, digital identity and digital trust. I mean, if you look at Singapore, um, you know, we have um, the Singapore uh, Smart Nation Digital Government Office. You have the corporate pass, you have the Sing pass, you have my info. If you look at Japan, you've got my number. And my number is now trying to revolutionize the way uh, banking and uh, things like that. Um, last but not least, I think if we look at all this, um, proliferation of API is actually going to be very critical in open banking. And that is going to cut across retail, uh, institutional, and even post-trade. Now, if I look at uh, APIs, um, it's not new. Uh, banks and financial institutions have been looking at it from a close, semi-close. But what is happening right now is like what uh, Sikun is saying. It's very horizontal rather than vertical right now. And I think um, at the end of the day, two things um, uh, that we see right now, because of this proliferation, um, customers have becoming more empowered and they want to be able to see, they want to be able to control, and they want the institutions they work with to be plugged in. And this whole co uh, concept comes up to this embedded finance concept. And that's uh, a trend that we are seeing uh, from my angle. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sutapa, let me uh, come to you. Uh, when you look at a market like Thailand, what are the mega trends that you have seen over the last two years? Uh, thank you, Georgie. Well, I think that my answer will be along the same line with Mr. Chi's response, is that among the mega trends in Thailand, accelerating digital adoption, especially in financial services, for the past few years could have stood out the most. Um, since the introduction of Prompt Pay program in 2017 by the Bank of Thailand, in which the mobile numbers and national ID numbers are linked with bank accounts, cross-bank transaction fees uh, were made extremely low and especially free for, essentially free for small transactions. So um, follow up uh, in 2018, uh, standardized QR code for payment systems was introduced and made eligible nationwide. These lower fees and additional convenience have led to widespread adoption of mobile banking technologies among the major population groups. Also, if you look at the rise of a COVID-19 crisis, also played a crucial role in further accelerating Thai population digital adoption. So on top of the pandemic itself, a larger share of population who never adopt mobile banking before, they now do so under social distancing measures. The, and also the implementation of government relief programs through digital channels such as Pao Tung uh, app by Grung Thai Bank also incentivize even more people to learn new technologies. I uh, want to add here that uh, the aging society trend in Thailand prior to the pandemic was posing a major concern for the speed of digital adoption when we compare ourselves to regional peers with younger demographics. However, as today evidence suggests, uh, the older demographics in Thailand no longer resist digitization. The force of pandemic-related adoption and ease of new technology on mobile uh, banking and other services have largely outweighed the older population's reliance on traditional face-to-face -face transactions. Interesting, uh, the speed of digital adoption in uh, Thailand. Uh, let me come to uh, Vietnam and uh, Momo. Uh, uh, Mr. Do, can you sort of give us your perspective on the market, like what's happening in Vietnam as a whole in terms of digitalization? Sure, yeah. I think um, uh, Vietnam is, of course, is it have a very much same trend with the whole world and especially uh, the country in Southeast Asia. Um, uh, let, and the speed of visualization is really, uh, increasing significantly in the last two years. Um, let me uh, share in a three different angle. 
from the enterprise, from regulation, and from the user behavior. So uh, for the enterprise, um, uh, actually the, the one key thing in Vietnam is that for, for 2022, uh, Vietnam is pretty good in controlling the, the pandemic, but, um, uh, at, but at, in 2020, yes, it's good, but in 2021, we have a pre pretty severe uh, lockdown uh, that the whole Ho Chi Minh, the largest city, have, have been strictly locked down for like a, about three, four months. So everything really changed in, in that, those three, four months. Um, the use, everyone have stayed at home, even the food delivery is not uh, allowed to operate and e-commerce affect. Um, so, so in that, um, a, a lot of the, the mindset is shift. So the enterprise now is seeing that uh, they cannot they no longer be able to do the business in the same way. The retail business, have for all the big one have have been forced to go online and basically restructure their whole organization to be more you know nimble and 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 be able to adapt with the new situation even for the small like f and b restaurant they now they have to learn to using the app to sell their product online and the group chat is become become marketplace that a lot of people buy and sell in a group chat so, so that really create paved the way for the, uh, I would say digital transformation for the country, I think it would be like speed up at least many times compared to the, you know, the previous, uh, you know, times. From, from the regulation standpoint, uh, the, the government, the Vietnamese government seeing that uh, digital, digital transformation is one of the most important way for the country to grow. So from, from the minister level, from prime minister level, uh, have been done a lot of uh, activities and effort to, to push for that. Case in point, State Bank of Vietnam, now they allow for the users to open the bank account fully online. Before the pandemic, I, 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 I would say never dream about this. It's, it's like something too, uh, too difficult to do. But, but now in Vietnam, everyone can open the bank account on 100% online. There's a big move and so on. Like, and many other things is come along. Um, so in, in the user behaviors, the many, many things that the users doesn't familiar with, like the users scan the QR code or they get that QR code scanned by others, which is the main payment method in Vietnam, is not familiar before the pandemic. But now we in Vietnam we have the app called PC COVID that is become the national app that everyone have to use, use it to scan or being scanned by you know by by the by by the you know, restaurant. And, and then everyone learn about QR code in just so in a couple of days and, and understand how to use very well. And, and, and every, you know, big things, start with small things, with users learning how to do things that they never have to learn before. And now they think that, you know, technology is something not too difficult and everyone can be easily to use the phone and the app, you know, uh, very well. So that really created a big shift in the mindset uh, as technology is not difficult to use. Um, so I, I'm very, I think a pandemic rate of very difficulties, but uh, in terms of digitalization technology, I think it really uh, give uh, the country a big push to move forward. Got it. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Sutapa, let me come back to you. Uh, you are a spin-off uh, from SCB, which is the oldest bank in uh, Thailand. Uh, specifically, related to online lending, we've seen the boom in Southeast Asia, but there are very few who cater to the small and medium-sized uh, businesses. How big an opportunity um, is this space, not just in Thailand, but um, across Southeast Asia? Because some analysts even say this is like a trillion dollar opportunity. Um, the number varies uh, from um, different sources. 
But in terms of opportunity sizing in Southeast Asia, uh, I believe there remains considerable gaps in credit access for micro SMEs. Um, well, at least if you look at the Thai market, according to IFC, uh, Thai micro SMEs constitute about a third of Thailand GDP and more than 80% of Thailand labor force. So among the Thai micro SME firms, about a half are either fully or partially constrained by financial access. From many sources, that's also confirmed pretty much the similar uh, scenarios with other uh, countries in the region as well. So these stats uh, suggest that there are indeed strong opportunities for startup to address the untapped credit demands. So given the size, um, being able to serve these market uh, segments would not only bring solid business opportunities, but also substantial social impacts. Um, and whereby we at SCB Abacus took it as our missions to address these underserved segments in the formal credit uh, mark, uh, industry. So the missing gaps for the traditional banks are numerous. Um, firstly, the micro SMEs generally require help with short-term unsecured working cap rather than the long-term collateralized loans, which banks prefer. Secondly, most uh, small SMEs uh, have very thin credit profiles, especially for micro businesses whose incomes came in cash. And also traditional banks, uh, lengthy approval processes and documentation requirement create even further barriers for very time sensitive and budget constrained small entrepreneurs. So once we see these gaps, uh, what uh, this uh, FinTech startup have done differently from the bank is, uh, we can serve those with thin credit profiles through our underwriting that relies more on um, alternative data sources. To simplify the uh, procedure, the, our entire loan uh, approval process in our app, which is called Money Thunder, is done purely online with our human intervention in the back end. That allows us to uh, grant decision within 20 minutes from downloading the app to distributing money. Uh, into that account. And uh, we, so far we have captured a growing portion of previously underserved market with, uh, with about a year or so in operation, we have 6 million app downloads and dispersed loan volume surging tenfold within one year. So it is our mission to serve more than 10% of Thai underserved workforce by 2024, as well as potentially expand to regional markets with similar problems for small businesses. That's a tall mission. Uh, you have a strong uh, this thing, like big targets that you have set for yourself. Uh, just wanted to shift the conversation a bit. Let's look at Singapore. Uh, when we look at again challenges of banking digitalization, it's actually very very different uh, in Singapore. One of the things that everybody has been excited about talking quite a lot about in Singapore is the new entrance in the digital banking space, the digi banks. Um, how does the largest, the most established player like a DBS. So what's your reaction to the digi banks and how do you sort of prepare for a threat that, that or do you see them as a threat? Well, uh, thank you, Georgie. Um, I would say digi banking or digital banking is already a reality in Singapore. So in certain respects, um, the new entrants are coming into a space that already exist. Um, having said that, I would say that we take all competition seriously, particularly uh, some of these new entrants actually do come uh, with uh, relatively large backing, uh, with relatively large uh, base of customers themselves. Uh, but having said that, I don't think it's necessarily going to be a walk in the park, uh, as we have seen actually in many markets where digital banks have entered the market. So in Singapore in particular, digibanking is already a reality. Now, having said that, we also, in DBS, while we are the largest bank, full suite of products, um, um, dominant market share, uh, we haven't been sitting on our laurels. So we have also been investing in our business uh, for the last many number of years. So with the full-fledged uh, products uh, and, and services that we already have, I would say, just to take an example, uh, many of the areas which, uh, which digi digital banks go into would be in the area of digital wallets, in the area of um, payments. Um, we have invested in uh, Pela, for those of you in Singapore, you know. Now, Pela started off as a 
digital wallet for peer-to-peer -peer payment. And it has actually rapidly evolved over the last couple of years from P2P into a P2M or P2B. And we have also partnered with many um, ecosystem partners. And through the app now, it's like a super app where you can book um, a private hire car, you can book a taxi, you can order your food, you can uh, buy a movie ticket. You can do a lot of things through it and, and pay through it. You can go through e-commerce on it. Uh, at the same time, with that same capability, you are able to scan and pay on QR codes pretty much around uh, many, many places in, in, in Singapore. So this is just a, a case in point, right? Now, the one thing I would like to add is that, you know, technology is not the monopoly of these startups or tech companies or these digibanks. These same technologies that are being adopted are the same technologies that we have already adopted over the last number of years. So we have, for example, also built up our AI capabilities. Uh, and as, as we speak, we are already crunching about uh, 10,000 customer uh, attributes and churning out 30 million customer insights every month. So hyper-personalization, for example, is what we are, have already built in to our entire customer journey, the way we do business. It is now DNA for us. So these are ways by which we have already started to, to um, uh, prepare ourselves. And so you can see for us, uh, DigiBanking is not a slogan. It is already the way of life. It is the way uh, we do businesses today. Now, as we look further, oftentimes the narrative, I would say, of um, new entrants would be that they are here to serve the underserved or the unserved. Um, I guess in Singapore, um, there is probably a very small segment, if at all, of the underserved or the unserved. I pretty much bang everybody in Singapore already. Um, and even uh, the migrant workers. Just to give you an example, some might say, well, the migrant workers are the underserved or the unserved. I already bank the vast majority of them digitally. And this was shown during the COVID um, uh, circuit breaker when they had to be quarantined in their, um, in their um, uh, 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 dormitories where we were able to even help those who didn't have accounts as yet open accounts remotely. We opened 40 over 1,000 accounts over one weekend um, and then helped them to remit money remotely back to their um, families at home who are waiting for money. And we helped to facilitate payment from their employers to them digitally. So a lot of all these are already reality. So I hope that gives a flavor of, 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 of what it is like. I mean, just one final point and I hand the time back to you, Joji. Is that um, I guess a lot of entrance as well uh, that we have seen in other markets, not so sure yet in Singapore because it hasn't quite gone live, is that they started off also competing on the back of uh, pricing. Now that can probably be a starting point, but it is not sustainable as we have seen in some other markets already, particularly in a place like Singapore where margins are in themselves rather thin. So I don't think there's a lot of room for that. So I think we are quite well prepared. Uh, I'm quite confident. Uh, without uh, being complacent, that uh, having been recognized as the best digital bank in the world several times and best bank in the world several times, we do think that we can hold our own and probably be ahead. Interesting. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, when, Magdo, let me come to you and sort of ask you the Vietnam perspective. Uh, most of Southeast Asia, including uh, Vietnam, they sort of completely skipped the landline telephone revolution. They went directly to the mobile phones. Uh, similarly, most of Southeast Asia, again, skipped the, the personal computer, the desktop uh, revolution. They, the first experience of internet was on their mobile. And now we are seeing the third way where, except Singapore, most of Southeast Asia has skipped the banking revolution. You know, they're not using the checkbooks. They're not physically going into a bank to open accounts, but they're doing everything from their wealth management, trading, mutual funds, remittances, investments, all on their mobile phone. So. Uh, what, what was the game changer? Was it the mobile revolution or was it that we finally have companies uh, such as Momo and others who have built digital platforms that enable users to do all of these on the mobile phones? Yeah, thanks, thanks for the questions. That's a very good question. Um, yeah, back um, for the history of Momo, um, you know, back in 2010, 
um, you know, we, we co-found, uh, I am myself and a couple of others co-found Momo and we, we give the name is like Momo stands for mobile money at that time. So we believe that in the next 10 years, uh, like mobile phone will change the game. And, and we're like, we're very consistent with just being on mobile. At that time doing web is much easier. And at that time we have to work with the uh, telco to provide the service, which is not very successful because of the user experience is not there. But it gives us a lot of lessons that we can catch the revolution uh, of, of smartphone so we launched our first uh, smart uh, app on smartphone in 2013, and and we learned a lot, and we really booming uh, about one or two years after that. So I think um, I think it should be combined of the both things. First is the mobile revolution is really help uh, us to to fly, and together uh, it is like company like us who think and very well prepare to capture the opportunity to make it happen. Um, so in Vietnam now, like uh, using smartphone is become the norm. And even in, in rural areas, the smartphone penetration is, is very, very high. And as I said, COVID is a, another very big push with the speed, uh, you know, with a big change of technology that to combine uh, really give a very good, uh, you know, they win for, for, for the change in financial service on the mobile, uh, on the, on the, on the mobile technology in the next couple of years. So now, um, uh, like I, I shared previously on, on, uh, Momo app, we partner with banks. We can already provide cash loan, uh, buy now, pay later, uh, investment product. So, so every, every everything. Um, will be just 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 ready just on uh, just on on people's hand uh, with just a few click away. Got it, uh, Tadis. Let me uh, come to you uh, in terms of you've heard from all the panelists in the different trends in digitalization that they're seeing. Uh, again, looking at it from the uh, SMBC Innovation Center, how much did the pandemic accelerate? Did we see like? Normally, with something that would have taken maybe five to ten years being shortened into a single year? Um, yeah, thanks for the question, Joji. I think um, from our uh, standpoint, um, what has happened is the pandemic has just accelerated uh, a lot of the initiatives uh, that I guess some of the financial institutions or the industry uh, partners have uh, actually been putting in place. So I'll, I'll give you a good example. Um, when SMBC started this journey of what we call transformation internally for our wholesale business, uh, we started reaching out to some partners and says, you know, why don't we go to our customers, co-create solutions together and address their pain points. And like what, you know, was mentioned earlier, um, a lot of them were very focused on their verticals. Uh, what has happened uh, with the pandemic is we've seen a lot more conversations now and willingness by I would say big techs, red techs, and even um, you know SI, so, uh, I guess system integrators to work together to come up with solutions together for customers. So um, a press statement was made quite recently at the Singapore FinTech Festival in 2021, where NEC and SMBC put out a press statement about co-creation, uh, digital solutions for clients. So that is an example of what we do. The, the second one, I think, is uh, for ourselves, the way we look at partnerships has totally changed as well. We have to basically start to understand that partners are here to stay. They're not competition. We have to embrace them. And we have to make sure that the piping, uh, what I call the piping, which could be APIs and uh, you know, AI, which is what we call the energy source, uh, have to be in place in order to get... Um, this uh, ecosystem I've been going. So I think that's what we are seeing um, from our standpoint. The final point is I think the opportunity is very, very big. Uh, I'll give you a very good example. Um, Everyone is always talking about digital banking and I think uh, my esteemed panelists mentioned it's already here to stay, it's already happened. Um, SMBC has a digital bank franchise in Indonesia known as Genius. We started that five years ago and they've celebrated five fantastic years. Um, and what has happened is that during this pandemic, two things have happened. 
We've seen adoption rates uh, going about 20% to 25% year on year. That's why. Uh, the second thing is uh, our developers have started to go out and listen to the voice of the customer and accelerated those developments of those things that they need back into the application and try to integrate that. I think the future is uh, very much driven by the customer needs, the customer centricity, and also the balance between, um, I would say, human interaction and digital delivery. So that's uh, my view at this moment of where we, we, where we sit. Thank you. Since you mentioned digital banking, just a quick related question. You talked about uh, SMBC offering it through your subsidiary in Indonesia. You picked up a stake in a Philippines company, RCBC. Now, they are also been talking about digital banking um, quite a bit. So for a large conglomerate like you, how big is this an opportunity? Um, I think if you look at um, the SMBC middle term plan or what we call mid term plan uh, mentioned, uh, we are very focused on what we call Asia-centric strategy. And we've actually picked a couple of growth markets. Uh, Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia, India, they're just some of the key markets that's publicly known. And what we've done is we realized that our experience in Indonesia since we've invested in 2014 is these countries are very diverse. And we've decided to put the digital first adoption strategy in a lot of the things that we're doing when, when we invest in them. Um, in the case of Philippines, where we have a stake in RCBC, which is publicly known, the pandemic created what we call a turning point. Um, the management, I would say, at our RCBC, and they launched uh, a digital app uh, or digital man called Disca Tech, um, basically said, let's shove the plans for, I would say, physical branch expansion, and let's just uh, experiment and accelerate digital, right? And that is what happened, uh, I would say, about 18 to 24 months ago. Uh, interestingly, pandemic came. The government, in this case, decided to partner with the banks to distribute social protection schemes. Uh, and today, Discotech basically serves close to about 4.5 million households, about 22 million customers, and cover about 73 or 74 provinces out of the 81 in the Philippines today. So that's really you know, where we, we see you know, um, technology, enabling digital finance for inclusion and basically being able to touch the lives. I think um, that's all about um, what we have seen. Uh, and that's where uh, the bank wants to continue to grow, uh, one on the retail space. And the second is really much on the commercial space, which we talked about working with customers to basically integrate and embed into their workflow. Got it. Uh, Shri Kun, let me come to you. Uh, at DBS, a lot of the things that we discuss, uh, and as you mentioned, are things that you have already been doing for a while. So as we you know, go deeper uh, into the digital economy, what are the new opportunities uh, that are left for companies like you? Well, um, there, I would say that um, the whole landscape continues to evolve, right? Uh, and, and we must believe, if we look into history, that there will always be new innovations, new opportunities that arise. And so we have constantly been uh, working on, on uh, new areas. So even within, I would say, what would be traditional banking, right? Um, apart from a balance sheet uh, business uh, that most banks would have, uh, we would say that in the last couple of years with uh, ultra low uh, interest rates, uh, that in itself had led to many banks um, actually having very, very compressed um, uh, revenues from the angle. So what we had already done was also to pivot and started to build a very much more robust and stronger non-interest related kind of uh, income products and services, in particular um, in the wealth management space uh, uh, in financial planning. So even in a place like Singapore, uh, which is a rather mature economy, uh, there is still a lot of opportunities um, in democratizing wealth. So we have obviously got our wealth man management offering for the higher net worth individuals. But Singapore is actually a very homogeneous society uh, with a lot of people who remains, um, uh, that, that, that continues to have need for financial planning and retirement planning. So we have built a lot of our AI capabilities. For example, we have built this new tool called the DBS NAV Planner, which is a self-directed AI-led uh, uh, tool that our customers can go and do financial planning. And from there, we will send them 
hyper-personalized nudges right from what they need from their savings to their investment opportunities to insurance to the fuller-fledged retirement planning. So that's an area where we have seen um, in the last couple of years now 2.6 million of our customers actually adopting this. Um, so this is a, a new area. Uh, we are also constantly looking at developing areas, um, like for example, uh, as we talk about the metaverse, right? how that space is developing is also what we have been exploring. So we have also dipped our toes into it actually, um, uh, I think about two years ago, right? when we, uh, when we leveraged uh, Fortnite to create a, a, a virtual nightclub from which we marketed our Live Fresh uh, credit card. So we, these are little things that we are, we are kind of dipping our toes into. We have, we have I'm not sure whether you all would have read, uh, we have launched uh, Patio, uh, which is a blockchain-enabled kind of a payment platform. Uh, we have launched our DDEX, uh, the DBS Digital Exchange. Uh, we have launched a Carbon Exchange. So apart from actually continuing to build on capabilities within our existing suite of products, we are looking at new areas. In the SME space, likewise, we've continued to digitalize. And uh, just now when uh, uh, Dr. Sutapa was talking about the micro SMEs, right? So in Singapore, we already have a, a very strong SME business and we have continued to reach out also to the micro SMEs uh, through digital lending. Um, and over the COVID period, we have actually disbursed $6.2 billion of uh, loans, uh, all kind of applied for, approved, disperse digitally. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sutapa, let me uh, come to you. Just a follow-on question to this. Uh, one of the big opportunities uh, we have discussed is the credit opportunity for SMEs, micro SMEs. Uh, the number of SMEs in the whole of Southeast Asia, I would assume there are a couple of hundred million of them. And when, it, when we talk about digitalization, many of them still don't use digital solutions. Uh, and we've seen a lot of investors from the private equity space, venture capital space, sort of putting, uh, investing significant amounts of capital into digital solutions uh, for, uh, for some of these, what you call the mom and pop stores. Um, how big is that a space across Southeast Asia? Um, I would say that the space of mom and pop stores who have been online, it have been online, but also uh, growing rapidly online is indeed one of the biggest opportunities in Southeast Asia. Um, I think when we look at uh, Thailand, for example, 40% uh, of total workforce uh, are within the micro uh, enterprises group or the mom and pop stores, as you mentioned. So uh, the usage of digital tools for business ranging from Facebook marketing to uh, mobile banking has gone up from 80% to 90% during the pandemic across or pretty much um, countries in Southeast Asia as well. And um, our uh, customers also said that uh, the use of online tools have essentially kept their business running during the pandemic, uh, while they continue to use both online and online uh, tools. So uh, on that sense, um, switch the, the banks uh, or traditional banks and also the FinTech players are helping those online traditional players in the market to switch into more uh, dual mode for online and offline and, and offline to uh, and online to offline eventually. So, uh, but I want to point out that the uh, mom and pop stores are not the only growing segments. The key growth areas also include the gig uh, economy workers, such as the delivery riders and other freelancers as well. Uh, more and more of them are becoming uh, are populating the online uh, platforms. So whose number has been rising since before and throughout the pandemic? So at the early stages, um, digital lenders also benefit from increasing digital footprint. This is to help with underwriting, as well as increasing digital literacy uh, among entrepreneurs and workers to ensure conversions. So um, I think beyond lending, uh, other forms of fintechs are also expected to gain from offline to online movements such as uh, what Mr. Chi mentioned as payment channel, the online payments can help reduce transactional costs and certainly quicken their processes. At the later stage though, uh, FinTech players can expand their services as their customer move from necessity phase in their life cycle to security phase. And uh, after a fraction of micro businesses and gig uh, workers become more successful in their own career, 
their financial needs will, grab, uh, will transform and likely to move upward. So among the financial products, they could be looking for protection financial uh, services such as insurance, uh, micro wealth management, for example, and, um, and even small investment services. And these will become much more important in the years to come. Got it. I just have a quick uh, add-on question to you. You run the Money Thunder app in uh, Thailand. Uh, you right. spoke about uh, we, you know, how you've been able to be it credit, be it the financial needs of the gig economy workers, the mom and pop stores. What is it that the technological advantage that you hold over a traditional bank that allows you to serve this segment of the population which a, a bank can't? Um, I would say that I would totally agree that uh, the startups, be it digital banks or others, uh, should never attempt to compete on pricing. And, uh, and, and, and in my observations, they do not. Uh, instead, they compete on their technology and also the sharper focus afforded to startups because they are serving a very small segment of the population as opposed to a uh, larger conglomerate. And uh, we were part of one as, uh, as, as in my last decades of working in the banking industry. So we see that the focus is really crucial to uh, serving this small segment of the um, social problem. And we also seek our partnerships when we serve customer best. So uh, coming back to the quest on, on uh, your question, Georgie, on technology, we built our own uh, in-house AI automation that allow us to create a smooth customer experience uh, in which customers spend less than 20 minutes to access um, lending. Uh, we make sure that they do not compromise privacy and security. The trust issue has become much more important, uh, particularly through the pandemic. And so we want to make a focus on uh, making and educating and also working with the customer so that they can understand our service uh, fully. Um, uh, they can fully trust the, uh, the integrity of the service. Uh, the machine learning, uh, hyper, um, the hyper personalization on risk and collection engines uh, has allowed us to underwrite with alternative data and expand the credit to the thin file uh, customer and also uh, on the operational side, the chatbot with personalized menu and messages. Um, I just want to point out it's chatbot has been used um, many years for many years, but our chatbot can handle 93% of all user inquiries compared to 70 to 80% industry standard that allows us to expand uh, and allow us to scale. So um, beyond the, beyond the in-house tech though, uh, we make it our North Star metrics to measure social impact. And uh, from the work that we have done for the last uh, few years, uh, for the last two years, 40% of our borrowers have been refinanced from predatory lendings. Two thirds of our borrowers are female, compare that to about 40% are female in the Thai financial system. And 16% of our borrowers are between the age of 20 to 25. Uh, such, uh, um, such segment has been served with only about 3% of overall uh, uh, Thai borrowing system. So when we measure that and we track what we contribute, uh, that's also creating uh, an incentive and, um, and, and you know, the, uh, the collaboration within the team to move forward and help serve this group of customer that will eventually graduate from the necessity phase into the later later stage in their career. Got it. Uh, when Magdo, let me sort of come to you and look at Vietnam again. Uh, about 80% of the transactions in Vietnam are still offline. Uh, for somebody like you, in the sense that, uh, how do you get the people who have, for example, the Momo app to use you for all services, like maybe by paying for a cup of coffee or, you know, when they buy movie tickets, when they plan a trip, buy air tickets, like, how do you get them to expand to use like digital solutions in all their daily purchases? That is one. Uh, and I also wanted to ask you secondly on opportunities, you know, beyond just the traditional wallet thing. Like, how do you see sectors like buy now, pay later, consumer loans for Momo? Sure, thank you. Um, I think the most uh, challenging things uh, for us in the last, um, 
you know, more than 10 years uh, of development, Momo is um, how to educate the users and how to create the trust. So that is a fundamental that we need to go. So for trust, uh, multiple way that we need to do it. Uh, we we um, basically uh, really build a, build a brand that uh, we really care about every user's uh, uh, you know, problems. So, um, so with that, we use a lot of machine learning, a lot of, uh, you know, technology to make sure that uh, you know, every small detail in the product have to be taken care of. Um, like Dr. Sutapa mentioned, like the chart board, like everything, uh, like also adopt in, inside the company. And all is developed in-house to create the best user experience. Um, another big part is the, how to educate the users. Um, we, we actually we very struggle the first few years, but uh, then we see that uh, doing the gamification is a very good way to educate the users with uh, complicated uh, ideas. And secondly, uh, we uh, used like uh, friends and family uh, and also the, the influencer uh, educate the users together with us. Um, so uh, talking about the gamification, so we heavily uh, using gamification. Uh, we, at least uh, we have a free big campaign using gamification a year to educate the, the users in one multiple way, like in uh, educate people about money transfer, normally in the Lunar New Year, like you know, in the next uh, two weeks, we launch, a, last five years, we launched a very big campaign for a red envelope to educate users in multiple way. Or we educate, have the games like for the Momo City, educate about the users about the um, buy now, pay later and investment product. So, um, and, and the last thing is uh, after educate, after building your trust, we need to have the large enough ecosystem uh, for the users so they can use the wallet whenever it, it need and wherever, you know. So uh, that moved to the very big part that uh, you guys already mentioned, the MSME part. So now uh, we, in the last year and in the next couple of years, we also invest heavily in moving uh, uh, the MSME in Vietnam to go digital. Uh, that's one of the, is a big investment for us in terms of uh, human resource in terms of technology, as well as um, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the M&A strategy. Um, so uh, we already provide the service, like like small thing, like we create every small shop, the official account, so they can have the online presence and they can access to, you know, um, multi, um, 10 million, uh, 30 million of uh, user base. Uh, and there was a, we create a deal market that they, if they have a deal, they can also, you know, use the deal to reach out to the one. So, so that uh, would be the first part. Uh, the sec for the second questions, uh, you asked about expanding to new services. Um, so the, the, question, the answer is yes. Uh, we closely partner with um, banks and financial institutions to de develop the product that uh, have the best user experience uh, to serve the consumer. Just last year, we together with TP Bank, we launched uh, we, what we call is a pay letter e wallet, which is I believe the best digital product in Vietnam that the uh, users can uh, you know open uh, get a credit line in just one minute. Normally in Vietnam, it takes you like at least days or even a couple of weeks to get a credit card. So with us, it just takes one minute. Um, <coughs> so uh, the numbers of users is skyrocket and uh, and really become a very good financial uh, instrument for the for the people in the difficult time of COVID. So uh, we also expand to many other investment product uh, partnership buying and uh, and start, you know many other fun. So I think the future is bright. And uh, we are working hard to, to really create the financial inclusion in Vietnam. 
agreed the future is bright but one more quick question to you uh, you know momo is a unicorn you've raised several rounds of capital a lot of stuff that many of the startups in the fintech space offer has been heavily subsidized by venture capital or private equity money now as banks scale up and start offering the same products like you do what is the road ahead for companies like momo do you see yourself becoming more like the traditional banks going forward no uh, i i don't think so um I, actually um i think um i think maybe in the future the two will may converge somewhere but currently it's still a bit two different world uh like traditional bank and the, we we come from tech so the, the our mindset our dna our the way of you know our our, our habit our behaviors very different from a, a bank in vietnam um and um, and secondly we are focused on small money focus on small transaction when normally the bank want to move to that areas but still have a lot of legacy have a lot of uh, you know barrier in, in mindset in risk management that make them difficult to move um so um yeah i i cannot you know tell the future like 10 years but i believe in the next 3 to 5 years um um i think uh, the partnership would be the best way to to de- deliver the best product for the market like we have done with the bank in vietnam and we going to to have a you know get capital and many other banks in vietnam we we work together got it uh, we're almost running out of time we are actually all uh, run out of time i just want to quickly before conclude ask both of you here in singapore just one question each uh, that is let me start with uh, you uh you picked up a 49% stake uh, in a company uh in vietnam uh, which is uh, fe credit uh just wanted to understand uh, smb's ra- smb's rational in the sense that do you see yourself leveraging um, fe credit and expanding to other parts of southeast asia that is one uh you also have um, invested in financial institutions in hong kong indonesia cambodia so how do you sort of again leverage uh fe credits expertise to expand to these geographies okay i think um it's i'm going to try to do it in one minute um i guess um two things is one is everyone is on a different trajectory path yeah um so therefore i don't think we're going to be taking what we call from one and plugging it to the other but there are commonalities um whether it's to do with uh ai driving credit decisions or whether it's the ability for the local partner to really educate us and collaboratively uh, build a uh, knowledge base um and just a point right um why we invest in SB credit is because uh, SMBC consumer finance actually operates in Thailand, Hong Kong and China so there are some commonalities uh, out there and i think the last point i want to add is how we're going to hit that uh, button in order to bring everybody together it's not about plugging one to the other but i think it's really creating an a partnership ecosystem and i think i look at it from two points one is there's this slogan in smbc recently which is really to be a financial group chosen by design by the customer so everything is driven by design i think the second one that we really want to do is that the within smbc we are now considering how to build a ecosystem in terms of what we call joint learning and by bringing all the investee companies smbc itself giving everyone the flexibility to innovate and then basically bring it back um and taking it to the next level and last but not least in order to do all this making sure that both us as a bank as well as our investee companies are very strong both in terms of capital and also uh the ability for them to have the uh market that they operate in so strong in their local markets and they are able to execute their strategy in a very timely manner so I, I, with that i think that's uh how we look at it and uh, hopefully we can uh, drive that multi franchise strategy which you are talking about got it so what do you mean to say sorry i'll just come to you so what do you mean to say is just apart from fe credit you have investments in philippines indonesia hong kong cambodia india all of these places so you, you see all of them working together right is that what you're saying i think um i would like to answer that question me slightly later but i think it's always a journey to get them there got it and my final question uh, to dbs like in the sense that when you look at opportunities going forward how do you see things like you know metaverse internet 3.0 cryptocurrencies all of that well uh, thank you i think um 
this is a, a space that is, I guess, e evolving and, and quite rapidly. So with uh, Web 3.0, I would say that it is something which, which will redefine the world. Right? This is a new architecture by which I think the world will interact, industries will interact. Right? And uh, how we see it is that going forward, that while there is going to be potentially disruption, some form of disintermediation, having said that, uh, at the end of the day, I think human beings right, will still look towards institutions, especially institutions of trust. Right? So we do believe that there will continue to be a role for financial institutions, but we need to develop our, our product services, our thinking, to actually blend in and work within uh, this new landscape, right? uh, whether it's the metaverse or Web 3.0. So that's the way we look at it. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, both of you, for joining us in person. I'm sorry we can't take any audience questions. We are already about seven minutes past our time. Uh, to our panelists, uh, uh, you know, from uh, Thailand, uh, Dr. Uh, Sutapa, and uh, from uh, Momo in Vietnam, like, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I think it was a great session. Uh, it was interesting to hear how all of the countries are placed in different trajectories and I think 2022 will be another exciting year in terms of digitalization for this part of the world. Thank you all. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.